Section four of an account of Egypt by Herodotus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An account of Egypt by Herodotus. Section four. The males of the ox kind they consider to belong to Apophos, and on account of him they test them in the following manner. If the priest sees one single black hair upon the beast, he counts it not clean for sacrifice. And one of the priests who is appointed for the purpose makes investigation of these matters, both when the beast is standing upright, and when it is lying on its back, drawing out its tongue, moreover, to see if it is clean in respect of the appointed signs, which I shall tell of in another part of the history. He looks also at the hairs of the tail, to see if it has them growing in a natural manner, and if it be clean in respect of all these things, he marks it with a piece of papyrus, rolling this round the horns, and then, when he has plastered sealing earth over it, he sets upon it the seal of his signet ring, and after that they take the animal away. But for one who sacrifices a beast not sealed, the penalty appointed is death. In this way, then, the beast is tested, and their appointed manner of sacrifice is as follows. They lead the sealed beast to the altar, where they happen to be sacrificing, and then kindle a fire. After that, having poured libations of wine over the altar so that it runs down upon the victim, and having called upon the god, they cut its throat, and having cut its throat they sever the head from the body. The body then of the beast they flay, but upon the head they make many imprecations first, and then they who have a market, and Helene sojourning among them for trade, these carry it to the market-place and sell it, while they who have no Hellenes among them cast it away into the river. And this is the form of imprecations which they utter upon the heads, praying that if any evil be about to befall either themselves who are offering the sacrifice or the land of Egypt in general, it may come rather upon this head. Now as regards the heads of the beasts which are sacrificed and the pouring over them of the wine, all Egyptians have the same customs equally for all their sacrifices. And by reason of this custom none of the Egyptians eat of the head either of this or of any other kind of animal. But the manner of disemboweling the victims and of burning them is appointed among them differently for different sacrifices. I shall speak, however, of the sacrifices to that goddess whom they regard as the greatest of all, and to whom they celebrate the greatest feast. When they have flayed the bullock and made imprecation, they take out the whole of its lower entrails, but leave in the body the upper entrails and the fat, and they sever from it the legs and the end of the loin and the shoulders and the neck. And this done, they fill the rest of the body of the animal with consecrated loaves and honey and raisins and figs and frankincense and myrrh and every other kind of spices. And having filled it with these, they offer it, pouring over it great abundance of oil. They make their sacrifice after fasting, and while the offerings are being burnt, they all beat themselves for mourning. And when they have finished beating themselves, they set forth as a feast that which they left unburnt of the sacrifice. The clean males, then, of the ox kind, both full-grown animals and calves, are sacrificed by all the Egyptians. The females, however, they may not sacrifice, but these are sacred to Isis. For the figure of Isis is in the form of a woman with cow's horns, just as the Hellenes present Io in pictures, and all the Egyptians, without distinction, reverence cows far more than any other kind of cattle, for which reason neither man nor woman of the Egyptian race would kiss a man who is a Hellene on the mouth, nor will they use a knife for roasting spits or a cauldron belonging to a Hellene, nor taste the flesh even of a clean animal if it has been cut with the knife of a Hellene. And the cattle of this kind which die they bury in the following manner. The females they cast into the river, but the males they bury, each people in the suburb of their town, with one of the horns, or sometimes both, protruding to mark the place. And when the bodies have rotted away and the appointed time comes on, then to each city comes a boat from that which is called the island of Prosopitis, that is, in the delta, and the extent of its circuit is nine shoins. In this island of Prosopitis is situated, besides many other cities, that one from which the boats come to take up the bones of the oxen, and the name of the city is Adarbacus, and in it there is set up a holy temple of Aphrodite. From this city many go abroad in various directions, some to one city and others to another, 
and when they have dug up the bones of the oxen they carry them off, and coming together they bury them in one single place. In the same manner as they bury the oxen, they bury also their other cattle when they die. For about them also they have the same law laid down, and these also they abstain from killing. Now all who have a temple set up to the Theban Zeus, or who are of the district of Thebes, these, I say, all sacrifice goats and abstain from sheep. For not all the Egyptians equally reverence the same gods except only Isis and Osiris, who they say is Dionysius. These they all reverence alike, but they who have a temple of Mendes or belong to the Mendesian district, these abstain from goats and sacrifice sheep. Now the men of Thebes, and those who after their example abstain from sheep, say that this custom was established among them for the cause which follows. Heracles, they say, had an earnest desire to see Zeus, and Zeus did not desire to be seen of him. And at last, when Heracles was urgent in entreaty, Zeus contrived this device. That is to say, he flayed a ram, and held in front of him the head of the ram, which he had cut off. And he put on over him the fleece, and then showed himself to him. Hence the Egyptians make the image of Zeus with the face of a ram, and the Ammonians do so also after their example, being settlers both from the Egyptians and from the Ethiopians, and using a language which is a medley of both tongues. And in my opinion it is from this god that the Egyptians call Zeus Ammon. The Thebans then do not sacrifice rams, but hold them sacred for this reason. On one day, however, in the year, on the feast of Zeus, they cut up in the same manner and flay one single ram and cover with its skin the image of Zeus, and then they bring up to it another image of Heracles. This done, all who are in the temple beat themselves in lamentation for the ram, and then they bury it in a sacred tomb. About Heracles I heard the account given that he was of the number of the twelve gods, but of the other Heracles, whom the Hellenes know, I was not able to hear in any part of Egypt, and moreover to prove that the Egyptians did not take the name of Heracles from the Hellenes, but rather the Hellenes from the Egyptians, that is to say, those of the Hellenes who gave the name Heracles to the son of Amphitryon. Of that, I say, besides many other evidences, there is chiefly this, namely that the parents of this Heracles, Amphitryon and Alcmene, were both of Egypt by descent, and also that the Egyptians say that they do not know the names either of Poseidon or of the Dioscuroi, nor have these been accepted by them as gods among the other gods. Whereas if they had received them from the Hellenes the name of any divinity, they would naturally have preserved the memory of these most of all, assuming that in those times as now some of the Hellenes were wont to make voyages and were seafaring folk, as I suppose, and as my judgment compels me to think, so that the Egyptians would have learnt the names of these gods even more than that of Heracles. In fact, however, Heracles is a very ancient Egyptian god, and as they say themselves, it is seventeen thousand years from the beginning of the reign of Amasis, from the time when the twelve gods of whom they count that Heracles is one, were begotten of the eight gods. I, moreover, desiring to know something certain of these matters so far as might be, made a voyage also to Tyre of Phoenicia, hearing that in that place there was a holy temple of Heracles, and I saw that it was richly furnished with many votive offerings besides, and especially there were in it two pillars, the one of pure gold, and the other of an emerald stone of such size as to shine by night. And having come to speech with the priests of the god, I asked them how long a time it was since their temple had been set up, and these also I found to be at variance with the Hellenes. For they said that at the same time when Tyre was founded, the temple of the god also had been set up, and it was a period of two thousand three hundred years since their people began to dwell at Tyre. I saw also at Tyre another temple of Heracles, with the surname Thasian. And I came to Thasos also, and there I found a temple of Heracles set up by the Phoenicians, who had sailed out to seek for Europa and had colonized Thasos. And these things happened full five generations of men before Heracles, the son of Amphitryon, was born in Hellas. So then my inquiries show clearly that Heracles is an ancient god, and those of the Hellenes seem to me to act most rightly, who have two temples of Heracles set up, and who sacrifice to the one as an immortal god, and with the title Olympian, 
and make offerings of the dead to the other as a hero. Moreover, besides many other stories which the Hellenes tell without due consideration, this tale is especially foolish which they tell about Heracles, namely that when he came to Egypt the Egyptians put on him wreaths and led him forth in procession to sacrifice him to Zeus. And he for some time kept quiet, but when they were beginning the sacrifice of him at the altar, he betook himself to prowess and slew them all. I for my part am of opinion that the Hellenes, when they tell this tale, are altogether without knowledge of the nature and customs of the Egyptians. For how should they, for whom it is not lawful to sacrifice even beasts, except swine and the males of oxen and calves, such of them as are clean, and geese, how should these sacrifice human beings? Besides this, how is it in nature possible that Heracles, being one person only, and moreover a man, as they assert, should slay many myriads? Having said so much of these matters, we pray that we may have grace from both the gods and the heroes for our speech. Now the reason why those of the Egyptians whom I have mentioned do not sacrifice goats, female or male, is this. The Mendesians count Pan to be one of the eight gods. Now these eight gods, they say, came into being before the twelve gods. And the painters and image-makers represent in painting and in sculpture the figure of Pan, just as the Hellenes do with goat's face and legs, not supposing him to be really like this, but to resemble the other gods. The cause, however, why they represent him in this form I prefer not to say. The Mendesians then reverence all goats, and the males more than the females, and the goat herds too have greater honour than other herdsmen. But of the goats one especially is reverenced, and when he dies there is great mourning in all the Mendesian district, and both the goat and pan are called in the Egyptian tongue, Mendes. Moreover, in my lifetime there happened in that district this marvel. That is to say, a he-goat had intercourse with a woman publicly, and this was so done that all men might have evidence of it. The pig is accounted by the Egyptians an abominable animal. And first, if any of them in passing by touch a pig, he goes into the river and dips himself forthwith in the water, together with his garments and then two swineherds, though they may be native Egyptians, unlike all others, do not enter any of the temples in Egypt, nor is any one willing to give his daughter in marriage to one of them, or to take a wife from among them. But the swineherds both give in marriage to one another, and take from one another. Now to the other gods the Egyptians do not think it right to sacrifice swine. But to the moon and to Dionysus alone at the same time and on the same full moon they sacrifice swine, and then eat their flesh. And as to the reason why, when they abominate swine at all their other feasts, they sacrifice them at this, there is a story told by the Egyptians, and this story I know, but it is not a seemly one for me to tell. Now the sacrifice of the swine to the moon is performed as follows. When the priest has slain the victim, he puts together the end of the tail and the spleen and the caul, and covers them up with the whole of the fat of the animal which is about the paunch and then he offers them with fire. And the rest of the flesh they eat on that day of full moon, upon which they have held sacrifice, but on any day after this they will not taste of it. The poor, however, among them, by reason of the scantiness of their means, shape pigs of dough, and having baked them, they offer these as a sacrifice. Then for Dionysus, on the eve of the festival, each one kills a pig by cutting its throat before his own doors, and after that he gives the pig to the swineherd who sold it to him to carry away again. And the rest of the feast of Dionysus is celebrated by the Egyptians in the same way as by the Hellenes in almost all things, except choral dances. But instead of the phallos, they have invented another contrivance, namely figures of about a cubit in height worked by strings, which women carry about the villages, with the privy member made to move and not much less in size than the rest of the body and a flute goes before, and they follow singing the praises of Dionysos. As to the reason why the figure has this member larger than is natural, and moves it, though it moves no other part of the body, about this there is a sacred story told. Now I think that Melampus, the son of Amethion, was not without knowledge of these rites of sacrifice, but was acquainted with them. For Melampus is he who first set forth to the Hellenes the name of Dionysos, and the manner of sacrifice and the procession of the phallos. Strictly speaking, indeed, when he made it known, he did not take in the whole, 
but those wise men who came after him made it known more at large. Melampus then is he who taught of the phallos which is carried in procession for Dionysos, and from him the Hellenes learnt to do that which they do. I say then that Melampus, being a man of ability, contrived for himself an art of divination, and having learnt from Egypt he taught the Hellenes many things, and among them those that concern Dionysus, making changes in some few points of them. For I shall not say that that which is done in worship of the god in Egypt came accidentally to be the same with that which is done among the Hellenes, for then these rites would have been in character with the Hellenic worship, and not lately brought in, nor certainly shall I say that the Egyptians took from the Hellenes either this or any other customary observance. Matters concerning Dionysus from Cadmos the Tyrian, and from those who came with him from Phoenicia to the land which we now call Boeotia. Moreover the naming of almost all the gods has come to Hellas from Egypt, for that it has come from the barbarians I find by inquiry is true, and I am of opinion that most probably it has come from Egypt, because, except in the case of Poseidon and the Dioscori, in accordance with that which I have said before, and also of Hera, and Hestia, and Themis, and the Charites, and Nereids, the Egyptians say themselves, but as for the gods whose names they profess that they do not know, these, I think, receive their naming from the Pelasgians, except Poseidon. But about this god the Hellenes learnt from the Libyans, for no people except the Libyans have had the name of Poseidon from the first, and have paid honour to this god always. Nor, it may be added, have the Egyptians any custom of worshipping heroes. These observances, then, and others besides these which I shall mention, the Hellenes have adopted from the Egyptians. But to make as they do the images of Hermes with the phallos, they have learnt not from the Egyptians, but from the Pelasgians, the custom having been received by the Athenians first of all, the Hellenes from these by the rest. For just at the time when the Athenians were beginning to rank among the Hellenes, the Pelasgians became dwellers with them in their land, and from this very cause it was they that began to be counted as Hellenes. Whoever has been initiated in the mysteries of the Kabiroi, which the Samothracians perform, having received them from the Pelasgians, that man knows the meaning of my speech. For these very Pelasgians who became dwellers with the Athenians used to dwell before that time in Samothraki, and from them the Samothracians received their mysteries. So then the Athenians were the first of the Hellenes who made images of Hermes with the phallos, having learned from the Pelasgians, and the Pelasgians told a sacred story about it, which is set forth in the mysteries in Samothraki. Now the Pelasgians formerly were wont to make all their sacrifices calling upon the gods in prayer, as I know from that which I heard at Dodona. But they gave no title or name to any of them, for they had not yet heard any, but they called them gods from some such notion as this, that they had set in order all things, and so had the distribution of everything. Afterwards, when much time had elapsed, they learnt from Egypt the names of the gods, all except Dionysos, for his name they learnt long afterwards, and after a time the Pelasgians consulted the oracle at Dodona about the names, for this prophetic seed is accounted to be the most ancient of the oracles, which are among the Hellenes, and at that time it was the only one. So when the Pelasgians asked the oracle at Dodona whether they should adopt the names which had come from the barbarians, the oracle in reply bade them make use of the names. From this time they sacrificed using the names of the gods, and from the Pelasgians the Hellenes afterwards received them. But when the several gods had their birth, or whether they all were from the beginning, and of what form they are, they did not learn till yesterday, as it were, or the day before. For Hesiod and Homer, I suppose, were four hundred years before my time, and not more. And these are they who made a theogony for the Hellenes, and gave the titles to the gods, and distributed to them honours and arts, and set forth their forms. But the poets who are said to have been before these men were really, in my opinion, after them. Of these things, the first are said by the priestesses of Dodona. And the latter things, those namely which have regard to Hesiod and Homer, by myself. As regards the oracles, both that among the Hellenes and that in Libya, the Egyptians tell the following tale. The priests of the Theban Zeus told me that two women in the service of the temple had been carried away from Thebes by Phoenicians, and that they had heard that one of them had been sold to go into Libya and the other to the Hellenes. 
and these women they said were they who first founded the prophetic seats among the nations which have been named and when i inquired whence they knew so perfectly of this tale which they told they said in reply that a great search had been made by the priests after these women and that they had not been able to find them but they had heard afterwards this tale about them which they were telling this i heard from the priests at thebes and what follows is said by the prophetesses of dodona they say that two black doves flew from thebes in egypt and came one of them to libya and the other to their land and this latter settled upon an oak tree and spoke with human voice saying that it was necessary that a prophetic seed of zeus should be established in that place and they supposed that that was of the gods which was announced to them and made one accordingly and the dove which went away to the libyans they say bade the libyans make an oracle of ammon and this also is of zeus the priestesses of dodona told me these things of whom the eldest was named promenea the next after her Timorite, and the youngest nicandra and the other people of dodona who were engaged about the temple gave accounts agreeing with theirs i however have an opinion about the matter as follows if the phoenicians did in truth carry away the consecrated women and sold one of them into libya and the other into hellas i suppose that in the country now called hellas which was formerly called pelasgia this woman was sold into the land of the thesprotians and then being a slave there she set up a sanctuary of zeus under a real oak tree as indeed it was natural that being an attendant of the sanctuary of zeus at thebes she should there in the place to which she had come have a memory of him and after this when she got understanding of the hellenic tongue she established an oracle and she reported i suppose that her sister had been sold in libya by the same phoenicians by whom she herself had been sold moreover i think that the women were called doves by the people of dodona for the reason that they were barbarians and because it seemed to them that they uttered voice like birds but after a time they say the doves spoke with human voice that is when the woman began to speak so that they could understand but so long as she spoke a barbarian tongue she seemed to them to be uttering voice like a bird for if it had been really a dove how could it speak with human voice and in saying that the dove was black they indicate that the woman was egyptian the ways of delivering oracles too at thebes in egypt and at dodona closely resemble each other as it happens and also the method of divination by victims has come from egypt end of section four recording by philip gould